Very good. Let me convene us. Good uh, morning or good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sandra Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean at the Boston University School of Public Health. And on behalf of our school, welcome in person and online. I'll note before we begin, this is actually our, an experiment. It's our first in-person public health conversation in more than two years, bringing people in person and having people on Zoom. We have over 600 people um, uh, on our Zoom and various uh, other uh, streaming uh, platforms right now. You know, it's been a long road to get to this moment, and I think we, like everybody else, are trying to navigate the best way to continue having conversations about topics of consequence, difficult topics, mixing in-person and hybrid efforts. And I want to thank everybody, both in person and on Zoom, for coming along for the ride. These public health conversations, we've always intended them to be spaces where we can come together as a community, and by community I mean the large C community, public health community, to debate, challenge each other, and engage with issues that matter most for the health of the public. We usually invite to these conversations distinguished speakers from all over the world who help guide our thoughts about core issues. Thank you to all our speakers for this event, and thank you to everybody else who is participating both in person and on Zoom. In particular, I want to thank our co-host, the Boston University Center for Emerging Infectious Disease Policy and Research, represented here by Dr. Nahid Badilia, the director, founding director. And thank you to everybody who made today happen, in particular the Dean's Office, the Marketing and Communications Team, and Dr. Matt Fox, who's a faculty member in our school who's been the intellectual architect of this day. You know, COVID has been, if we needed one, a reminder of the danger of infectious threats. While we have made much progress in treating and preventing COVID, the challenge of infectious threats remains with us. There is no guarantee that the next pandemic will not be more dangerous than COVID. What is more, long-term trends like urbanization and climate change could well worsen that threat over time. This makes it even more important that we apply the lessons of the COVID moment to shaping a healthier world, one that is no longer vulnerable to pandemics. Today, we aim to discuss how we can do so. Today's event is going to be divided into two sections. The first section will address what we did right and what we're doing wrong during COVID. And the second section will look at how we can prepare for another pandemic while working to reduce the risk that it will occur. Each of the sessions are hosted by different hosts. The first session will be hosted by Dr. Nahid Badilia. The second section will be hosted by Dr. Matt Fox. So I will now start by introducing the first session's host and partner in today's event, Dr. Nahid Badilia. Dr. Badilia is the founding director of the BU Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases Policy and Research and associate director of the National Emerging Infectious Disease Laboratories a state-of-the-art maximum containment research facility at BU. She's board-certified infectious disease physician and an internationally recognized leader in highly communicable and emerging infectious diseases with clinical field, academic, and policy experience in pandemic preparedness and response. Over the last decade, Dr. Badilia designed and served as the medical director of the Special Pathogens Unit, a medical unit designed to care for patients with highly communicable disease and a state-designated state Ebola treatment center. She has prior and ongoing experience in health system response to pathogens like H1N1, Zika, Lassa fever, Mar Marburg virus, and COVID-19 at the state, local, national levels. Dr. Bedelia serves on state, national, interagency groups focusing on biodefense, priority setting, development of clinical care guidelines, and medical countermeasures research. And Dr. Bedelia is also a terrific colleague here at BU. It's really a privilege to introduce you. Nahid, over to you. Thank you, Dean Galia, for that kind introduction. Um, should also be said, I'm almost here 11 years now in, in a few months, which is, which I wish I could say was as long as I've spent at an institution, but you'd be in competition with Tufts for that. So I want to, um, it is really my pleasure to moderate this morning's session, which is, uh, what do we get right? What do we get wrong? But really the question is, what are we continuing to get right? And what are we continuing to get wrong? Because the pandemic is not over. It's raging in many parts of the world. And here, where it seems a lull, the question is, is it a lull before the next surge? Or is it a new phase of the pandemic that we are still yet to experience? Just a quick note about the format of today's event before I turn over to the introductions. For those of you in the audience, if you have a question after each of our, um, each of our speakers have given their remarks, just raise your hands and wait until the mic has been passed to you to ask your question. If you're part of the audience that's joining us remotely, just put in your question into the Zoom Q&A, and the staff here will ask that question on your behalf at the, end of the, at the end of the remarks from the speakers. So let me introduce our speakers for this event, um, who come from a really multidisciplinary background. But truly, you know, if we, if we were to talk about the lessons learned, the panel would be three times as large, because the lessons learned were in every single aspect of our lives everything from the biomedical, the public health, to communications, to community organizing, everything has changed. 
And I, what I ask the speakers today to do is that you will speak from your expertise. But I know that one of the things that many folks here would love to hear is speak to it as one of the humans has gone through this. How does this affect your public as well as personal sphere, your professional sphere? I think all of the last two years has affected all of our, the way that we frame the rest of the world around us. So let me introduce the first of our speakers. First, we'll hear Professor Natalie Dean. Dr. Dean is an assistant professor in the Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics and in the Department of Epidemiology at Emory Rollins School of Public Health. Her primary research area is infectious diseases epidemiology and design, study design with a focus on developing innovative trial and observational study designs for evaluating vaccines during public health emergencies. And she previously worked on Ebola, Zika, dengue, chikungunya, and now COVID-19. Dr. Dean also has a fun fact. Two of her Twitter illustrations actually made it into The Economist. Um, so I take that honor. That's great. Um, then we'll turn to Dr. Angela Rasmussen. Dr. Rasmussen is a virologist at the Vaccine and Infectious Diseases Organization uh, at the University of Saskatchewan. Her research focuses on the role of host response in viral pathogenesis with a particular interest in emerging viruses that are or have the potential to become major threats to public health or global health such as avian influenza, dengue virus, Ebola virus, MERS-CoV, MERS as well as SARS-CoV-2. And Dr. Rasmussen's fun fact is that she was a Jeopardy candidate in 2016, I think you said? 15, that's right. And she has, she has been in a Twitter feud with Elon Musk, which all of us have wanted to do at some point. <laughs> Thirdly, we will hear from Dr. Maria Sundaram. Dr. Sundaram is an infectious diseases epidemiologist and associate research scientist in the Center of Clinical Epidemiology and Population Health at the Marshall Clinic Research Institute. Her research focuses on respiratory viruses and the vaccines that prevent them, as well as the vaccine promotion and policy. More recently, her research showed that COVID-19 testing inequities had the potential to create bias in COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness estimates. So Dr. Sundaram, it wasn't a podcast that said, this podcast will kill you. So you should take a listen. I promise it won't kill you. Finally, we'll hear from Dr. Rajiv Venkaya. Uh, Rajiv Venkaya. Uh, Dr. Venkaya is the CEO of Arium Therapeutics, a venture-backed company developing therapeutics against SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses with pandemic potential. He was the president of the Global Vaccine Business Unit at Takeda Pharmaceutical Companies a position that he held until February 2022, so just a couple months ago, where he led a vertically integrated business developing vaccines for dengue and Zika. Prior to joining Takeda, he was a special assistant to the president for biodefense at the White House. In this capacity, he oversaw U.S. preparedness for bioterrorism and biological threats and was responsible for development and implementation of the national strategy for pandemic influenza. The floor is yours, Dr. Dean. Hi, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here. So I'm uh, actually a BU alum and uh, born and raised in Massachusetts. And it's always wonderful to come home and particularly to be with this really great uh, group of speakers. So today we were asked to talk about what do we get right and what do we get wrong? Obviously a big question. I decided to narrow my focus a little bit onto what I felt uh, particularly comfortable with, which is talking about clinical trials and infrastructure for clinical research. And this is something we've been thinking about since Ebola. I worked on an Ebola vaccine trial and since have worked with the WHO's R&D Blueprint Initiative on their working group for clinical trial norms and standards. And so the structure for my talk today, uh, I'm going to be talking about therapeutics and about vaccines. And I'm reflecting upon what did we get right, uh, uh, well, what went wrong, what went astray, what went right, and then where do some opportunities lie? So where is there some potential for uh, innovation? What are the interesting things that I think we should be paying attention to? And then I will provide some concluding thoughts. So where did things go wrong? I think to no one's surprise, I'm going to talk about hydroxychloroquine. Of course, that was a highly politicized issue, also got a lot of attention in the media, and maybe some, there were some bad faith actors, including uh, in the scientific community. And so, uh, but I'm not gonna focus on that. I'm gonna focus instead on the role of 
clinical research and clinical research infrastructure in leading to some of that confusion. And so the FDA did a, a review of the clinical trials and concluded that the vast majority of trials of therapeutics for COVID-19 um, were not designed to yield actionable information. A lot of that is that they were too small. They were not adequately powered to provide uh, reliable inference. And um, not all of them were randomized. There were discrepancies in how they were defined and designed, uh, made them difficult to compare. And in the context of a pandemic, many people wanted to contribute, and there were a lot of um, trials launched, but they were independent efforts. They were not uh, uh, as well coordinated, and many of them were too small. There was also duplication of effort, so there were people working on the same um, interventions in the same populations, but not coordinated there. And when you have a lot of small trials, you can get some false positives, some false negatives, and those conflicting results can contribute to, to confusion. I think in contrast, when we think about what went right, uh, the large, simple platform trials are really a shining example of how to do this type of clinical research. And for those who aren't familiar with the platform trial, you have a set of treatments that you start out with, and their individuals are randomized, including some standard of care. And over time, you look and you can see what treatments are working, and they can become standard of care. What treatments are not working, they drop out of the trial, and you can add more uh, intervention arms over time as they become available. And so you have this infrastructure that is really rolling along and can become an evidence generation, generating powerhouse. So there were many platform trials. I'll just highlight the recovery trial as one clear example with over 40,000 participants randomized. And one of the things that made the recovery trial so successful is that they were able to leverage existing data streams. So about 100% of their primary and secondary outcome data come from their national health service data. So that really makes things, um, you're able to expand a lot more because you're reducing those data collection costs. And it's contributed both by providing definitive positive answers, uh, like dexamethasone, some successes there, and then also negative results, because the uh, trial itself is so large that it can really kind of put to bed certain things and settle, settle the dust there and allow the scientific community to, um, to shift their efforts to, to, to reprioritize other things. Um, and so where do opportunities lie? So I think one of the key themes is the importance of large trials. But when we think about other patient populations, like maybe outpatients, um, I think there are some interesting opportunities in um, trials that are decentralized, where you can participate remotely. And so I flag you know, the Active 6 trial, where the eligibility is individuals with mild or moderate COVID. And you can sign up uh, over the phone, and your participation is by the mail. And so you're mailed the, um, the study treatment, and then follow-up is done remotely. And that affects what types of things you can measure. I think when we think about flexibility for the future, for accessing different patient populations, that there are some interesting opportunities there. So the next topic is just about vaccines. And I want to say where things went astray, not necessarily wrong. Um, but I am going to flag the Oxford-AstraZeneca trials that were run in the UK, Brazil, and South Africa. Um, and so these were separate trials that were, so they were initiated separately, but then they realized that they would be better served in order um, to, to combine the trials in order to reach a conclusion faster. And so that main paper in the Lancet is actually four separate trials. And so uh, because the decision occurred after the trials were launched, the trials had differences in their designs. They had different patient populations, different control groups, um, uh, different age ranges. And the inconsistency in clinical trial designs um, led to some confusion, among that also the uh, differences in the dosing. And the result was just not as clean of a result that was that um, that did cause cause some um, controversy. So, uh, in contrast, there were many trials that were you know the um, these vaccine trials were enormous, 
And there were many trials that were multi-country trials that included a lot of different regions. And I flag just the J&J &J ensemble trial as one example because it, um, because they planned, you know, in advance, they had the, the same protocol for all these different locations in the U.S., in Brazil, in South Africa. And I raise it because one interesting thing that happened is that different variants started circulating in these different areas. And so the trial fortuitously generated some of the first data that we had about the efficacy of uh, these vaccines in, in different locations ag um, against different variants. And then the last thing I want to flag, and I know another speaker will be talking about this more later, but Operation Warp Speed is really, uh, a, or the operation formerly known as Warp Speed, is a really interesting um, case study. And so they benefited from a, a, a network, a private-public partnership that included a network of statisticians and that helped coordinate the designs. I think that led to more consistency across the designs for the clinical trials they worked with, and also just a, a greater quality across the board. And they also had a shared trial oversight, so a single data safety monitoring board that allowed them to have some cross-trial knowledge. They see a safety signal in one trial. They're able to query the other trials, the other data sets. So there's some interesting commentary in the Journal of Infectious Diseases about this um, from, the D from the perspective of the DSMB reflecting on, on what they've learned. And I've learned a lot. I think there's also a lot of questions about what parts of that really worked um, and what parts may they want to change um, for the future. So I'll wrap up. So the central themes, I think what worked the best are really coordination um, and collaboration. And, uh, and as we sort of reflect, I mean, what are the most effective ways to prioritize research efforts when there are so many sort of rushed and large, these big efforts, but how can we coordinate them in a way that is sort of maximally effective? And also some honest reflection about some of the incentive structures that do lead to lots of single, you know, single site trials or people who are unwilling to share data and what are the ways that we can incentivize um, more collaboration. So in the face of this pandemic, despite you know, many failures, there have obviously been enormous achievements from, uh, in, in clinical research. And, uh, and I think these signal a path forward for the future. So thank you so much for uh, listening. All right, so thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Nahid, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm Andy Rasmussen. I am a virologist at Vito. I've also got all these other affiliations, including the Georgetown Center for Global Health Science and Security, as well as I'm the pillar two lead for a network in Canada called the Coronavirus Variants Rapid Response Network. And at the very end, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of our research, just because I do think it's germane to this topic. <clears throat> but I'm gonna talk about one of the most fun topics of this entire pandemic, and that is the origins of this virus. So I figured that all of my colleagues were going to be covering other topics uh, where, where mistakes have been made, and I think where we can learn some important lessons, such as vaccines and transmission and the epidemiology. Uh, but this is something that I think is still really important to understand as a virologist, because even though this pandemic has obviously gotten away from us, it's something that's happened, understanding where this pandemic came from, understanding where novel emerging viruses come from is really crucially important. And this has been a very toxic discussion space throughout the pandemic, um, but I will say that we have made some progress and along with a, a number of really brilliant colleagues from all around the world, we've just released these two preprints that are currently in review uh, that have really triangulated this first site of emergence of this virus to the Wanan seafood market in Wuhan. Uh, and you know, we are continuing to gather more and more evidence that we hope will, will make this even more clear. Um, but this is really what we think happened. In mid-December, or sorry, in mid-November to late November, at some point there were live animals being sold at the Wanan seafood market, which was not exclusively a seafood market. 
Uh, and at some point, there was not one, but two specific or two separate zoonotic spillover events that resulted in the spread of SARS coronavirus 2 into humans, and then it continued to spread around the market. And we've shown that this was uh, an important um, event in the entrance of this virus into the human population using a combination of geospatial analyses, uh, photographic evidence, some good old fashioned detective work, as well as phylogenetic analysis. But does this even really matter? Um, the raccoon dog is out of its cage, so to speak. The pandemic is out. We don't need to know about the origins to stop the pandemic. We certainly need to be working on vaccines and so forth, methods to stop transmission. Does it even really matter where this virus came from? And I would argue that it matters a lot because it certainly may not have a bearing on the outcome of this pandemic, but it certainly could potentially prevent the next one if we have a better understanding of this. So this is really important to note, and I think that this is something that in origin discussions gets lost quite a bit, is that the responses to this virus emerging were delayed. And that's because initially when the virus emerged, nobody knew that there was a virus emerging. There was not a, a clear signal when the first spillover occurred that a new virus had gotten into a human was beginning to spread. And we've seen this uh, through, through multiple analyses. We've seen that in Wuhan, uh, this was a review that, that me and some other colleagues wrote over the summer last year, um, that initially there were early cases in the vicinity of the Wanan market. But it wasn't until about a month later that we really started to see the excess deaths emerge from that area. It wasn't until mid to late December that people started going to the hospital. So the virus had this window of time to spread among people without being recognized for what it was. And Michael Warby, uh, my colleague, has since gone on using some really exceptional detective work to show that indeed this was the case uh, with these early hospitalizations. And uh, we've since now shown this as well with our geospatial analyses, looking at either hospital confirmed cases, cases that have been confirmed with genomic data, or cases that were reported uh, to Weibo based on symptomology. Um, there is a window of time when any virus emerges that it will be able to spread. And if we can't detect it when it's happening, we will be forced to try to contain it after the fact. So prevention requires a number of different preemptive responses. Um, there's of course surveillance, and there has been a lot of surveillance activity over the past 20 years or so. There's certainly been a lot of virus discovery work where people have gone out, they've sampled wildlife, they've sampled different human populations sometimes, looking for new pathogens. The problem with this work is that it's very informative, and you almost certainly will always find new viruses and new pathogens, but how do you know which of those pathogens is going to be the next one that actually causes a problem? Even with the Sarbeco viruses, the, the subgenus that includes uh, SARS coronavirus 2, a lot of these viruses have been found, but we didn't know which one was high risk compared to another one without doing more functional experiments. And that brings me to the next topic that we need. We need more basic research. We need research to understand which of these viruses can infect a person, which of them can cause disease in a person, which of them can cause disease in an animal, what tissues do they infect, uh, how are they transmitted from animal to animal or potentially from animal to human. We also need that information to go on to develop countermeasures such as pan-coronavirus vaccines or really pan-family vaccines. So coronaviruses certainly have caused this pandemic but it's not necessarily a coronavirus that's going to cause the next one. Could be an orthomyxovirus like influenza, could be a henipavirus or paramyxovirus, could be an arenavirus. There's a whole bunch of different virus families out there that have potential as pandemic pathogens. And how can we know which ones to develop countermeasures against? So we really do need to be doing this basic research on all of these viruses that we're surveilling to know which of these we need to worry about in the future. And then finally, we really do need sustained investment, both uh, in terms of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary research, as well as policy to support this, and of course funding. And this just uh, shows how NIAID funding does fall off a cliff for people who get their first R01 grant. Only about 50% of them, or a little over 50% of them, continue to get NIAID funding. So this work really does need to be sustained, and we've seen this pattern of boom and bust uh, funding for all of this type of research um, periodically. If you look at the coronaviruses, we've seen people work on SARS in early 2000s, people work on MERS in the, in the early 2010s, 
And then people now are working on SARS-2, but we're already starting to see the money go away for that. This work really does need to be sustained. This is a long game. So now just to finish up in completely self-interested part of the talk, I'm going to talk about what we are doing in Covarnet to try to address some of this. Um, we're really taking a multi-pronged approach where we're looking both at uh, the impact of variants on host responses because that's what I study. The other nice thing about looking at host responses is that the host is commonly what we're interested in. Doesn't matter the family of emerging virus, the host is the same if we're talking about a human pathogen. And we're doing that using transcriptomics and molecular virology, immune profiling, and pathogenesis studies. There are, of course, many other approaches, all of which are important. Um, we're also doing susceptibility screens to look at different hosts that might be susceptible and serve as reservoirs for so-called zooanthropenotic spillback. This is going to be really important going forward, not just for discovering new viruses, but for discovering new hosts for existing viruses that could pose a threat. And then we're using uh, various machine learning techniques to develop predictive signatures that can help us rapidly assess potential for pathogenicity across species. And this is just a, to follow back to the market origins, um, a project that we've got going on right now where we're taking all the different animal species that were being sold at the Wan and Seafood Market, we're taking ACE2, the receptor for SARS coronavirus 2, and making, expressing that in various cells that are not expressing ACE2. And then we're infecting that with various variants of concern or variants of interest, including the ancestral Wuhan 1 strain, to determine if these animals are susceptible using a variety of different techniques. We're also expanding this to other animal species throughout North America to understand North American spillback risks. Uh, and in the course of this, we'll also be doing surveillance for other coronaviruses to try to understand the threats that we may not have identified yet. And then finally, um, as I mentioned, we're using transcriptomics. We're taking all of this data from these experimental models, as well as doing RNA-seq to understand what the responses are to a host who's been infected with them, comparing that to clinical samples for SARS coronavirus 2 and data from the public domain to really increase the size of these data sets. And that will allow us to develop these predictive signatures, um, including signatures of susceptibility, pathogenesis, and look for immune correlates of protection going forward. Um, now, again, I want to emphasize this is just one approach of many, but I think we really do need to start thinking about how we can all implement various approaches like this to try to better understand the basis by which a novel pathogen can emerge into a new host and cause disease, be transmitted, and potentially cause a pandemic. Um, and with that, I'd just like to acknowledge all my many collaborators and the wonderful people in my lab, and thank you very much for having me here to talk. So uh, I was faced with um, uh, a real challenge. Uh, I think when you ask an epidemiologist this type of question, you're going to get a really broad range of responses. Uh, the question about what we got right and what we got wrong really reminded me of this part of uh, Breakfast of Champions by Kurt Vonnegut, uh, which is kind of everything and nothing. I find this question very challenging to answer, uh, and probably everyone else here does too. And so that, I think, means it's a really good question. Uh, to try and answer, but it also means I could talk for 10 minutes and not say anything of real value. So I'm going to try really hard not to say, uh, to say at least one useful thing today. Uh, and one of the most annoying things about epidemiologists is that our answer is always, it depends. And just one time I wanted to answer a question definitively. So here you go. Some things we've definitely learned, definitely gotten right about uh, COVID scientifically, I think on the whole as humans, farts are not a major vehicle of SARS-CoV-2 transmission. I don't know if y'all remember, but that was like a big thing in like April of 2020. Everyone was worried. Thankfully, we covered it. We crossed it off the list. It's also probably not worth our time to disinfect groceries anymore. Um, and so those are kind of like two easy, right things we got. I think it's easy to find the things we got wrong in retrospect. Um, and it, it's just hard to imagine something that is in some ways unimaginable. So for some, and like only some of those things, I think I should give us a little bit of a break. Um, one of the most prominent blind spots I think we had was the focus on influenza as the pandemic pathogen. Uh, so this is a perspective from December of 2019 um, that focused us on influenza as uh, the pandemic pathogen. And before COVID, I did a lot of flu work. I still do a lot of flu work. I was very on board the flu is the big one ship. Uh, and a good reason for this actually is that there was more research funding and infrastructure for flu than there was for coronaviruses at the time. 
uh, and this is the WHO preparedness, pandemic preparedness, and it just kind of talks about how important flu is, how everyone should look over there, there's flu, uh, don't look over here where there's coronaviruses. And other blind spots are fairly obvious in retrospect. I think we had an idea of a pandemic being maybe like a horror movie. Um, and <laughs> instead, somehow the truth is both more mundane and more horrifying. And that was, I think, something that was very hard for us to imagine as well. So aside from these things, the waters get a little more murky. I think there's so many things we could theoretically have gotten right or wrong about pandemic preparedness. Am I still on? Can you guys still hear me? Cool. Um, I've listed a few of them here, but of course it's not an exhaustive list. And it might be worth noting that almost all of these are topics that have been listed as goals for pandemic preparedness in the past, pre-COVID-19. Uh, and it's possible for us to go through each of these individual items and assess performance in quantitative and qualitative ways. And I think the real crux of the question for me is when we ask about what we've gotten right about COVID-19, and I think this is something that probably the other speakers today have also struggled with, is that the answer is simply not enough. So I do think we've learned quite an incredible amount over the past two years, and it's my opinion that what we've learned and what we've gotten right is largely a function of where we spend our time and money uh, and what we've historically valued in research. So we've learned uh, about the biological and virological underpinnings of this pathogen. We've learned about our immune response to it. We've developed vaccines in record time, which is an incredible accomplishment. But unfortunately, I really still feel like this not enough sentiment um, comes through very strongly. And some of this has to do with the fact that it wasn't really about getting the right answer, uh, but it was about doing something that needed to be done. Um, and some of that also had to do with the fact that uh, some things we would rather not learn and we'd rather not know. Uh, and these are things about how women still bear the brunt of economic pressures and are less heard in the communication space, today notwithstanding. Um, things about structural racism that we are complicit in with existing public health infrastructure and existing research topics valued the way they are. And it's frustrating to see these lessons learned from previous pandemics forgotten. So there's no shortage of information out there on what we need to do pr to prepare next time. And I think many of these recommendations are incredibly good. They're the kind of thing that we would probably look at right now and say, if only. Um, but I fear that the biggest guiding principle will not be these very good ideas, um, but instead it will be what we've already done. Right now I feel that we are setting an unfortunate precedent by relying on individual responsibility to solve collective action problems. And this is an approach that might fit culturally with a level of involvement that some of us would like to see from government and from policy, but in my opinion, <laughs> it's not conducive to strong, supportive public health policies that promote equity public safety and security, uh, and I'll include economic security in that as well. So in many ways, the reframing of these goals from structural to individual has kind of de-emphasized the amazing things that I think public health can accomplish. And rather than learning, it's almost a conscious choice to forget the lessons we try to learn from H1N1, from SARS 2003, from Ebola, and from many others. And as a result, I think many of us feel defeated, dejected, ineffectual, I feel fairly confident that many of us have had those feelings throughout this pandemic many times. At least I think I'm not projecting. Uh, and there are feelings of frustration mixed with increasing apathy. And I would like us to consider who benefits from that apathy. Uh, I think part of this is our troubled relationship as public health professionals with what appears to be sometimes politics, but might be better termed policy. Uh, earlier on in my education, I was taught that a person could either be an impartial scientist or an effective advocate, but not both. And the thought was, the moment you press for something, you've lost objectivity. Um, I don't think that teaching is as explicit anymore, but I do think that in the scientific community, there can be a lot of career and personal drawbacks to pushing for and advocating for policies. I think there's even more drawbacks if you're a woman, and even more if you're a person of color. And I believe quite strongly that those are the voices we need to hear most. So I looked up this article in the Harvard Business Review uh, because now that COVID's over, I have plenty of extra time for reading. That was sarcasm. Um, I'll say that it was helpful if only because it highlighted some large holes in my public health education. Um, my experience in epidemiology has really been infectious disease focused. And historically that education has largely focused on the pathogens that are out there and what kind of havoc they can cause and the vaccines and other tools we have to prevent them. 
uh, I was never asked or required to take a class or do any extracurricular reading on public health law, on sociology, social epi, communication skills, beyond writing an effective grant application. Uh, and if not for my amazing roommate, Becca Miller, who's now at UCSD, uh, I wouldn't even know the term social capital. And I think this lack of empowerment or, or engagement rather, or maybe a fear of engagement uh, with the nuts and bolts of public health policy is another thing we probably got wrong. And I think I hope we get right in the future. Uh, I wish I had been more educated in these things. So what I still hope we get right about this is that if COVID-19 can change the world, then so can we, not as individuals, uh, but as collective groups. I think how to solve a global collective action problem is maybe a bit above my pay grade, <laughs> thankfully. But luckily, the spirit of it means that one person alone doesn't have to come up with the answer. I'm really hopeful that this is something we haven't gotten wrong yet. And that together, we'll keep pushing for in, uh, structural interventions that can be better, uh, that can better help us prepare for the next pandemic. Uh, thank you, Dean Galea, and uh, thank you, Dr. Bedelia, for, for having me here. Uh, I have to say that it's, uh, it's great to be in person with people. This is the first time I've uh, been able to give a talk in the presence of others. It's also a little bit intimidating being around so many Twitter personalities. I, I want to thank all of them for the personal and psychological sacrifices they have made over the past couple of years to, to actually be in the mix educating the public because it is a, a tough battlefield and, uh, and the work that you've been doing has been uh, phenomenal and so important for, for the general public that is struggling to understand what's real and what is not. Uh, I also have to say uh, that while Nahid, I, it's been great to get to know you, um, at least online, I, I, a tiny part of me wondered if you were a bot. Uh, I can tell you that Nahid is not a bot, she's real. I can even tell you her breakfast sandwich preferences, having, having seen her in person. So everybody else that you'll see on stage is real too, which is, which is really great to confirm. So I, I have uh, you know, a lot that I could cover. Fortunately, I have uh, other people that have spoken before me that have, have covered many of the bases. I'm gonna try to avoid talking, repeating and, all, and talking about what may be obvious to many of you. I'll also focus most of my remarks on the industry and product development side of things because others have spoken about other parts of, of the problem. So in terms of what we have gotten right in my assessment, the, the obvious things I won't recap. The science behind vaccine development for this coronavirus was built upon the foundation of work done for SARS and MERS and other viruses. The mRNA vaccine platform was proven to be incredible, but that didn't emerge overnight. That had been years in the making thanks, thanks to public and private investment. And the fact that public-private partnerships were so important in de-risking the activities around product development uh, clearly uh, uh, played an important role in the successes that we saw. Now, what are the things that are, are less obvious? Natalie talked about Operation Warp Speed, uh, you know, what, no matter what somebody wants to change the name to, it will always be Operation Warp Speed that was incredibly successful. And one of the, the, the amazing things about Warp Speed and the recovery trial is that for the first time, you had governments and companies working together on master protocols and clinical trials that had multiple products being compared to common control arms or placebo arms or standard of care arms, which was a way to massively capitalize on the investments made, but also massively shorten time frames to get data on safety and efficacy of these interventions. Another element of success was doing things in parallel. When we think about product development, we often think in terms of phase one, two, three in sequence. And I can tell you in industry, the investments that you make in later stage clinical trials, which are quite expensive, typically follow de-risking that happens earlier in investment. That's a smart way to deploy your capital. But that's not a smart thing to do in a crisis where you need to get product quickly, 
Of course, you have to confirm that it's safe and effective, but the minute you know your product is safe and effective, you have to have large volumes of supply in order to protect populations quickly. You can't afford to wait to start manufacturing. So making investments in, work in, in raw materials and in capacity while the phase one and phase two and phase three trials were going on was critically important to be able to have supply at the time the data was obtained. The third lesson that may not be obvious is while we all celebrate mRNA, what is also incredible to me is that the other platforms were not that far behind in the grand scheme of things. Typically it takes five to 12 to 15 years to develop a vaccine. I know this because at Takeda, we developed a dengue vaccine over the past nine years on top of about 10 years of development before that, and that's finally, hopefully, going to be launched this year. That is typical vaccine development. In, in this case, we saw that for the non-mRNA vaccines, which are very, very complicated to develop, the vectored vaccines and the subunit recombinant vaccines with adjuvants, those were behind mRNA by just a few months. That was still years and years ahead of what we've seen in the past. And we got lucky. I shouldn't say lucky because I don't really believe in luck. We, mRNA worked, but there was no guarantee that mRNA would work. It had never been proven to work before that. So if mRNA had not worked, the good news is we had other modalities that were being evaluated in parallel that would have been available to us just a few months later. Now, what did we get wrong? a long list, much has already been covered. I uh, would be remiss if I didn't point out the obvious, which is that there was massive inequity in access to vaccines around the world. I won't dwell on that because I think everybody understands that that is a fact, that it's a huge lesson learned that we must address between now and the next pandemic. I also won't get into the details of the disinformation and the politicization that happened everywhere around the world, perhaps no worse than what we saw here in the U.S. that has undermined confidence uh, not just in public health, but in institutions in general. This will be a tale of impact of this pandemic, T-A-I-L, of, 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 of impact that will be felt for, in my, belief, in my view, years, perhaps decades. Uh, I will also point out that the fact that we did not have great antivirals at the beginning of the pandemic, and we now finally have antivirals that look promising, that was a big gap, and we need to make sure that that doesn't happen in the next pandemic. Now, what's What's less obvious? Uh, the first point I'll make is around manufacturing. There was huge optimism that we would be able to make massive volumes of vaccine quickly. The people that were stating that in general didn't have a lot of experience in manufacturing. There was zero discussion about the quality standards that you need to make meet in order to make vaccines available to healthy populations, including children, at some point in the future. The bar is very, very high, and it's very hard to meet that regulatory bar. And so commitments and promises were made by people that didn't understand the complexity. And ultimately, of course, everyone was disappointed in the timelines, the delays. When you see delays in vaccine availability, uh, you won't hear the reasons why, but it's often due to quality lapses. It's not that the companies are not good at doing what they're doing, it's just that this is super complicated. And it's inevitable that the most experienced vaccine developers and manufacturers will run into quality challenges. A second is that as we talk about the massive vaccine inequity around the world, we rarely, if ever, talked about the huge number of immunocompromised individuals around the world between five to 10% of populations in some places that have yet to accrue the benefit of vaccines. They're still unprotected. Now I'm saying that in, in, the, in the interest of a full disclosure, I'm now leading a company that is working to develop monoclonal antibodies with a priority to make them available to immunocompromised populations to give them a hope of protection and a somewhat normal life. But but this has not been discussed over the past couple of years. Once we had vaccines, many people declared victory and expected those who are still vulnerable to figure out how they're going to protect themselves. And that has been, a, frankly, a, a tragedy. I also think that at this point in the pandemic, we still don't have off-the-shelf protocols to be able to test policy, evaluate policy choices and questions in real time. We still don't have a, to my knowledge, a protocol for the next pandemic to assess whether masks work. 
whether closing schools works, what's the best way to approach safety in schools. When the next pandemic happens, CDC and other agencies like it should have an operations research capability ready to go so we're not two years into a pandemic and still wondering about the most basic elements of our public health response and whether they work. The final point I'll, I'll make around lessons learned is that it comes back to the vaccine inequity and, uh, and people point fingers at, at various places. Clearly companies played a role here, companies make decisions, but at the end of the day, who has the money determines where, in this case, vaccines go. And political leaders, uh, unfortunately, did not make the hard choice to ensure that vaccines would be available to low and middle income countries, low and low middle income countries in the same time frame they became available in high income countries. And, and people don't like to talk about that, but the reality is that this falls to the leadership of the richest countries in the world. Now, the reality is that those leaders are put into position to protect their own populations. That's why they were voted into power. And frankly, I've been disappointed in the public discourse. There are a small number of individuals you'll see on places like Twitter that are talking about this inequity, but it's very rare, or at least it was a year and a half ago, to see a political leader talk about this issue before their own populations had access to vaccines in, in rich countries. And so that is going to be probably the thorniest issue that we need to tackle between now and the next pandemic. Let me close by touching on, on two concepts. There is this thinking in the military that you are often left preparing for the last battle you fought. And that is my fear coming out of this pandemic, that we will think that SARS-CoV-2 was the worst virus we could face in terms of lethality or transmissibility, and that's what we will prepare for. There is a lot of room for a virus to be to create much, to be much more virulent, create much more severe disease, to be much more lethal, to be much more transmissible. We know that, we've seen that as variants have emerged. But I'll also reflect on the 1918 pandemic where we had a W-shaped curve in mortality. We saw very young children die unexpectedly of that H1N1 virus, influenza virus. And we saw people in their 20s and 30s die disproportionately. We call that a W-shaped curve. We did not see a W-shaped curve in this pandemic, and that has allowed society to largely ignore the impact of the pandemic. That could be different in the next pandemic, and you can just imagine if we started to see young children dying from a virus, how different we would feel about the situation today two and a half years into the pandemic. And I think it's very important for policymakers to think about that as we prepare for the next one. And the, very, the last thing I'll say relates to CEPI, where I, I have the pleasure of serving on the board. CEPI is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations that was created a few years ago to focus on epidemic threats in low and low middle income countries. Things like Lhasa and Nipah and Rift Valley Fever and Chikungunya and Ebola but in the pandemic, has become central to COVID vaccine development. CEPI has looked at the successes in vaccine development of this pandemic, which were to get to vaccine within 300 days, and it's, they've said, let's look at what the art of the possible is for the next pandemic. And they have proposed that we compress that 300 days, which is an incredible achievement, down to 100 days. We will have time later to talk about how, and, and Angie actually talked about many of the things we need to do in order to achieve that goal. But just think about the potential we have with today's technology. For the first time, we have the potential to take certain pandemic threats off the table. And that is an ability that nobody can take away from us. That is a gift that we could give to every single future generation. And I wanna end on that hopeful note that we are in a position of power when it comes to what we can do against this forever threat of infectious diseases. And I do hope we'll make the right investments, have the right focus and prioritization, because if we do, I think we will be able to achieve that incredible outcome. So thank you. Can we get another round of applause for our speakers? And um, a reminder again, if you have questions for the in-person audience, just raise your hand and a mic will be brought to you. And uh, we'll be keeping an eye for questions coming in from online on Zoom as well. Um, so I will take the moderator's uh, 
initiative here and just ask the question that I think some of you have talked about, which is what does global scientific collaboration look like after this pandemic? What do you want to see? <coughs> what, and I think you talked about trials, Natalie, you talked about, uh, you know, Angie talking about surveillance and the ability to share those findings. You talked about manufacturing and, and ensuring that there is that. Um, what, what does that look like? What would you like to see? Any of you? Well, maybe I'll start. Yeah. And uh, I will just say that this uh, gathering today is kind of emblematic of what I'd like to see. Um, today, I met a lot of people who I knew and feel like I know and in some cases have worked with and, and collaborated with who I've never actually met. Um, and one thing that is good about this pandemic, at least for me, um, is that I have met people way outside of the field of virology, but in adjacent fields like epidemiology and global health and vaccine development that are really essential to, to me doing a good job as a virologist. And so at the most basic level, I think global collaboration really does need to look like this. It needs to be truly multidisciplinary. And by that, I don't mean, you know, for your grant, you're writing that, oh, we have a, you know, a DNA virologist as well as an RNA virologist, as well as a host response focused virologist. But we have people from all around the, the scientific spectrum, including people from industry, including people who are policymakers, including people who are anthropological uh, or sociological behavioral experts. We really do need to move forward as a larger global health community rather than being remaining siloed in our individual fields. And I do think that that is something that that maybe has has sort of been done during this pandemic a little bit better than it had been done in the past. So I hope that continues. Great. Anything to add to that? I can add just the importance of, of building out networks, you know, in advance. And a lot of the successes have come from these networks that have been able to be leveraged. And the importance of having things prepared, you know, people who have these relationships together and are used to collaborating and sharing data and, um, you know, the, the networks that we build in sort of peacetime and maybe use for, for other things um, so that they continue to ha have that value. Um, but, but I think, yeah, what are the networks that we have that can be sort of, can uh, leap into action the, the fastest? I do think on the, on the scientific collaboration side, the preparation for the next pandemic that involves R&D against the families of viruses beyond coronaviruses and influenza viruses that Angie referenced uh, needs to be a collaboration between groups like CEPI and uh, NIH BARDA in the US. There's a new BARDA-like entity being created in Europe. There's one in Japan that's being stood up. And it would not make any sense to duplicate efforts. Hopefully, we will divide the R&D pie. Uh, the other uh, dimension to this is distributed manufacturing so that particularly the African region can be self-sufficient in producing high quality vaccines during an emergency. But of course, that requires the creation of an ecosystem that is only, that's in its early um, life cycle. Uh, and that'll take some time. But if you don't start now, it's, it's just going to take that much longer to develop. But I think, uh, I think creating that now will uh, allow self-determination by countries that has not existed in this pandemic. Anything to add, Maria? I, I, I think that you said it uh, really well that there is structural, uh, stru like structures that need to be in place, I think, for this to happen. I, I've heard this so many times that you know, interdisciplinary collaboration is really good and that we should do it and it's highly valued by the, the structure of the system and, and that we would love for you to add someone to your grant that is a different, uh, you know, a, in a different field and then you know, kind of when the rubber meets the road, uh, you have a tight grant deadline, uh, you don't have time or you don't know that person or they're busy with their other stuff. And, uh, and you know, it also kind of systematically is undervalued. And I think there is actually a gendered component to that as well. And so I, I really like the emphasis that like, not only do we need to focus on that, but we need to like find the structures that support that, including uh, public private partnerships and make sure that we continue to invest in them, just as Angie said. Do we have a, any in person questions? Questions for the first couple of speakers. 
One is considering there is only three labs in the world that study corona type viruses, one of which is in, around DC, one in Novosibirsk, and one in Wuhan. Do you find it an incredible coincidence that it originated in Wuhan? And the second question I have for the first speaker is, since we're not, um, since collaboration is a bit difficult, I'm wondering if you're aware of or have any reason to think why are we not using the blockchain so researchers can publish their research there and it would not be questioned who did it, when they did it, since it's immutable and yet it could be shared by everybody. So I can address the first question. Um, that's actually not completely correct. There are many more labs beyond just those three labs that have been working on coronaviruses. And this really started um, after the original outbreak of SARS coronavirus in the early 2000s. As I mentioned during my talk, um, there was a, a huge influx of funding for coronavirus research in 2003. And so there were many labs in the United States. Uh, there are labs in Canada, including the one that I work at now, um, and labs throughout Europe that were also working on those bat coronaviruses. There are also multiple labs in China and several labs in Japan uh, and in Korea, um, as well as in Taiwan. Uh, there's, there's labs throughout the world that are working on coronaviruses. So in that sense, no, I don't actually feel that it's a huge coincidence that SARS coronavirus 2 emerged in Wuhan. Um, I think that, you know, given Wuhan is one of China's, uh, I think it's the, the 11th biggest city in China, um, we would have maybe said the same thing if it had emerged in Beijing because there's a laboratory that works on, there are actually multiple laboratories that work on coronaviruses there. Um, I think that, that this virus is going to emerge. Um, viruses like this are going to emerge when certain conditions are met. And our work has shown that that a lot of these conditions were in place. So when the original SARS coronavirus outbreak occurred in 2003, um, that was linked to, to live animal trading. Um, that was linked to the wildlife trade. Uh, and we have seen since then that actually multiple sarbecoviruses have been discovered in multiple species throughout East and Southeast Asia. So it's also something that's not completely limited to China. Wuhan is also a very large city, and in the markets where the, the animals are sold, there are a lot of people in very close quarters. So if there is a spillover event, and there are probably many, many spillover events that simply aren't detected because they're dead ends, uh, because they don't get passed on to another person, um, but if you are in a large city like Wuhan, in an environment like a live animal market, you're going to have a lot of people interacting frequently with those animals and then interacting with each other. And that's exactly what our geospatial analysis shows as well as the environmental sampling data that this wasn't, it wasn't a coincidence in the sense that it was near the Wuhan Institute of Virology or the Wuhan CDC. It was absolutely uh, not a coincidence that it occurred at the Wanan market. Um, so I think that it, it is really important to understand that this risk is everywhere. Um, there are novel emerging viruses, and we, in some ways, got lucky that, that this was SARS coronavirus 2 and not something like Nipah that was highly transmissible from person to person. And that could emerge in China, too. That could emerge in the United States. That could emerge uh, in Southeast Asia. We don't know the full breadth of all of these viruses that are circulating in nature. And that is something that we do need to figure out so that we can really understand you know, where the next pathogen might come from and also so that we can not worry about speculating as to whether or not it's a coincidence or not. Um, there are certainly things that we can do to make our activities less risky. And that's not necessarily doing less virology research. That's figuring out ways that we can interact with animals, with each other more safely. And I'll let Natalie take the next question. Oh, yeah. I, I, so I'm not so familiar with the blockchain, but I will, um, but I will say, you know, one thing we've seen is just the, the extraordinary value of data curation and data organization and just thinking about academic products as not just being scientific discoveries, but also the real incredible work that people do to innovate in the space of, of just create, of maintaining and sharing and um, uh, organizing data. So. I think there's a lot of research into sort of the research, research itself, <laughs> that, um, that that can be recognized. 
So that's interesting, though, right? Because after the 2013-2016 Ebola virus disease epidemic, there was this question of how do we share data very quickly? How do we share research very quickly? And one of the things that came out of this was the preprint phenomenon, which really became big during this pandemic. And, and that's had both good things and bad things, right? Um, can you guys reflect a bit more on, so preprints are most of the times the portals that allow us to submit research that researchers have done that have not yet gone through peer review. But that gets looked at by the public. It, everybody who reads it has to take it with a grain of salt because it hasn't gone through an independent review. It's allowed us to share that data. But could you talk about some of the ways that it potentially has not worked out well? Well, I, I would say that uh, it absolutely has accomplished the goal of getting information out sooner. If you look at the typical, you know, every, every peer-reviewed manuscript, if you read it, will show a date submitted and then a date accepted and a date published. And they, those are separated by months, typically. And so the preprint has allowed faster access to information for the scientific community. And I would say that it's been a huge boon for those that are in science because they can do their own peer review in many cases and be able to put the findings that are not yet peer reviewed into appropriate context. Where we have run into challenges is that because preprints, uh, there, there's no real filter. And so you can have all different qualities of science make it into a preprint. And those that uh, haven't uh, looked at studies in the past could take anything that's in writing as a fact and uh, we've seen in some cases in, in report on this in, in the media. Now, we, one thing that's been gratifying is to see the, some of the amazing science, science journalism uh, that has uh, come up during this pandemic. And I, I think that the great scientific journalists that are, that are out there are able to um, fact check and, and talk to experts about how they see a preprint before it actually has gone through peer review. And they will also um, use good judgment in what they uh, report on. Um, so I think that uh, we have to be careful about throwing the whole thing out because there are a few bad things that, that happen, but I do think we also there have a collective responsibility to, to try to help the public interpret what they are, are seeing on a preprint server like by archive or MedArchive. Great. We have another in-person question here. First of all, thank you. It's really extraordinary to sit here listening to all of you, learning from all of you at this point in the pandemic, so thank you. I was wondering if I can ask, you know, as I'm trying to organize my thoughts about this all the time, which I feel like I've been trying to do for the past two years, it seems to me like there are useful buckets. There's technical challenges and human challenges. Now, obviously, all technical are also human, but leaving that aside. And one of the biggest human challenges, of course, is this issue, which one of you raised explicitly, the rest of you raised implicitly, about individual responsibility, collective responsibility. And I was wondering if I could actually hear your thoughts about, you know, how we can think about that, let's say, between the extremes. Let's call them... Shanghai lockdown versus Texas, right? Where we're, we're really, like we've had across the globe the extremes of how we've been trying to wrestle with that collectively. And I'm just wondering where you're all at in that. Like where, where, where do we want to be at in terms of respecting individual autonomy, recognizing that different people have different tolerances for collective action, but also recognizing that there is a need for some collective action in order to protect all of us. Maria, I'll let you take that first. I'm so curious to know what everyone else on the panel has to say about this. Um, you know, I, I'm a little bit of a more pro like collective action person, and maybe that's because of my personality or my like Canadianness, or maybe it's because I'm a public health professional. Um, but uh, I think the 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 points at which we've seen collective action problems not be addressed are points where people don't really have trust in participating in collective action. Um, and I think that's also on us, at least partially, if not fully, as public health professionals. I think if we can demonstrate the value of public health to individual people, that is a reason to trust that public health has their best interests at heart. If we can demonstrate that we can get them tests for free, or we can get them vaccines easily and quickly, um, or if we can provide clear, consistent guidance, um, if we can be available to them for questions, those are kinds of things that, that do help increase trust and I think humanize potentially a little bit um, the work that we're trying to do. And I think uh, if it instead comes as this, well, we're asking you to do this thing, you don't have to do it, uh, and we're not gonna do anything else for you, good luck. Uh, you don't get paid sick leave, you don't get childcare. Uh, also, we're gonna maybe not cover some of your medical uh, insurance costs. 
Um, so, you know, do your own risk tolerance and, and you know, good luck. Uh, that's not like a good way to develop trust in public health infrastructure. And so um, I, I feel a little bit that I'm doubling down um, on the importance of those structures, but I, I really am very curious to know what everyone else on the panel thinks about that. Yeah, anyone? Well, I, Dean Galea, I think it's a, it's a very important question. Collective action mindsets don't show up overnight. They are built upon societal behavior before the emergency happened. And if you look at the countries where public health measures were taken up more readily by populations, these are places where social protection is embedded into people's mindset. The idea that everybody deserves a safety net. And I have to say that in the US, we don't have a great track record in safety nets for the population. We don't have this ingrained notion of social protection where everyone should get a minimum standard of health care, for example. And so in that setting, when you have a, an existential threat like a pandemic virus emerge, we in the US, unfortunately, uh, have this everyone is in it, you know, needs to take care of themselves mindset, which I think can be a very positive in some respects, but there are huge downsides to it, which I think we are being forced to confront here. And I, I think that this is something that we really need to grapple with the, the, the massive inequities that we saw and the impact of the pandemic here, which again, are not just a function of the pandemic, they just happen to reflect the way we've been operating as a society in this country for decades. Yeah, I would, I would agree with both of you. Um, I think that the, a lot of the issues with collective action, I mean, on, on some level, I guess getting people to cooperate with public health, as you said, Maria, is a matter of actually engaging them. Like you can't have public health without the public's participation. And so in that sense, it's, are you able to appeal to people as individuals on a large scale and get them to buy into this? But a lot of it is just like what you said. Um, if there's no investment in these structural means of taking collective action, then it, you're pretty much left with really the situation we're in now, which is like, okay, well, you know, you, you can get vaccinated. Um, and you can choose to wear a mask, um, and that's about it. Um, you know, good luck, uh, as you said, Maria. So I think that, you know, we really need to invest in these long-term structural fixes for this. And some of that, you know, in my own communication with people, I mean, I, I still have to explain to people what the central dogma of molecular biology is. That should be something that people are learning in the school. There's not a lot of scientific literacy in the general population, even among very highly educated people. Um, people are not comfortable necessarily talking about science, about viruses, about epidemiology, about medicine. Um, there, there's definitely a real challenge when it comes to communicating with people. And then when the structures aren't in place to support that, it's completely understandable, especially with all the disinformation that's around, for people to not have any trust in the system whatsoever. And I think that makes collective action very, very difficult. What a great point. And I, I think it mirrors what you guys are all saying, which is that if you, if there are fault lines before a pandemic, that's where our communities break, is along those fault lines when there is a crisis. And it's interestingly enough, a couple of our seed faculty are doing some research on frontline essential workers who are not healthcare workers and who continue to go out without a lot of the support that even potentially healthcare workers got within their space and, and what that meant in terms of infection there. Uh, Natalie, anything before we, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess I just, yeah, reflect upon our relationship with public health uh, as a you know in our country and and comparing it to some other countries I remember learning about in Japan and they've got these public health nurses and there's a relationship that starts very early on you know and and so when you think about trust right being built over time but it's that that um, recognizing where yeah where you can find those resources and the funding for those resources and just this sustained relationship um, that that's built over time that that extends beyond just uh, a, a, an emergency an infectious disease emergency so. Thank you. Any other in-person questions? We have one here While we're waiting for that the trust is broken now Where do we go from here? Where do we go from today to a point where we want to achieve before the next pandemic? 
Any thoughts before we take the question in the audience? I think we should just tell people to trust us again, and I'm, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I think that'll be fine. No, I mean, I think it's, I think we had a trust deficit for a long time. Um, and I, I would consider myself someone who, who does like a lot of vaccine epidemiology and vaccine hesitancy has been an issue for a really long time. Not just like post Andrew Wakefield, um, it, it's been an issue since the smallpox uh, vaccine. And so I think this is, is a good example of how we, the thing that would help us I think is investing in a structure that is not necessarily visible uh, and where the benefits and the ROI are not immediately obvious. Um, it's just only in moments like this where we turn around and say, oh, it would, it would have been really nice to have had that. Yeah, I'll just, call, you know, so I'm a, a biostatistician. Uh, I work on infectious diseases and, you know, so my training is like in likelihood ratio tests and things like that. So, I, you know, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And <laughs> I, know, I know that there's an extraordinary need for more research, research and resources for this the the um, the social sciences and the type of actual research that can investigate some of these questions on how to build trust and how dis disinformation is spread and it's a whole area unto itself and just making sure that 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 whole research area is supported. Question here. Yep. Great. Uh, really enjoying this. I have a question about communication and communication strategy. So I agree that you know rapid communication is vitally important. Uh, and preprints have been around, you know, 50 to 80 years at this point. But Facebook hasn't and Twitter hasn't. And, you know, when we have these debates out in the open where anyone can kind of contribute, I think that is a major factor in all of this, you know, hesitancy and disinformation, right? So my question is, you know, what, if any, reforms should we be making in our communication strategy where we're still getting the information out, but maybe not as quickly, and allowing us to be more circumspect about what we're putting out there. Because if we're changing our opinions you know, with the wind, uh, it may not in inspire much confidence in the public. So I understand where you're coming from with that, and this is something I really think about all the time and struggle with. At the beginning of the pandemic in January 2020, I had like 250 Twitter followers. And as of this morning, I have 350,000. Um, my audience has grown exponentially. And uh, the way that I've communicated has changed because of all that. We were, Matt and I were just talking about this this morning. I have people who still, you know, throw screenshots from January 2020 where I was telling people to get their flu shot because NCOV 2019, which is what we were calling it at the time, you know, hadn't really caused any cases in the US yet. Um, now this is the thing I think that's fundamental to understand about science and this is where, when we were talking earlier about collective action and the need for increased science literacy, I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding among the public about how science works. That we actually don't say something and then it's set in stone and it's certain. We continue to gather evidence. We continue to develop hypotheses. Sometimes the evidence we gather falsifies those hypotheses, and then we have to make a new hypothesis and test that. We are not very good at communicating to people that when new information comes out, it may not be the final word on a subject, and it may not be scientific consensus. Um, and I you know, certainly have loads of people on Twitter who like to remind me of all the times I've been wrong. I'm the first person to admit that I'm wrong, but actually that usually gets kind of ignored just in favor of reminding me that I've been wrong before. Um, and I don't think that that means that we should withhold information until the science is settled, because there's a flip side to that too. Um, for starters, people will have less trust because they think you're hiding information from them during a pandemic, and especially when things are very uncertain, as new information emerges, it is really critical to get that out to the public if it's something that's going to influence public health policy and especially rapid responses. And honestly, I mean, I wish this weren't the case, but social media is a source of information for policymakers as well. Mm -hmm. So I think what needs to happen are a couple different things. 
The social media companies themselves need to be better about keeping misinformation off their platforms. And disinformation, which is different than misinformation, but misinformation is when it's you know, unintentionally spread. Disinformation is when it's intentionally spread. And there are very sophisticated disinformation specialists who you know, spread all this information far and wide. I mean, there's the anti-vaccine movement is probably the best example of this. They are very, very good at what they do. And it's up to the social media platforms to make sure that the information that is being shared is, is reliable and that people aren't taking that up and, and seeing what you know, may not be a consensus in the scientific community as that's what they think about it. And then they're spreading this disinformation to other people. And ultimately, that can have really harmful results on public health, such as people deciding not to get vaccinated. So I think it's really challenging, though, because the social media companies haven't really figured out a very good way to do this. Um, they are not experts. And they, as far as I know anyways, haven't consulted the proper experts to help them vet this information, which is very difficult to do anyways, uh, especially with things that are very uncertain. I mean, scientists disagree with each other all the time. And that's also a normal part of the process. So I think that some of this could be solved just by helping people understand how the scientific process works and that just because somebody was wrong about something or changed their mind about something doesn't mean that, that they're not good at their jobs or that they shouldn't be trusted or that they're a bad actor. Um, that we need to help people understand that this is part of the normal part of the process, especially when it's a novel emerging pathogen that none of us know anything about. Yeah, and that, to that last point, and I think, um, Erica, you could probably share this, we had a really interesting uh, webinar with Aspen, a panel with Aspen Institute in Science and Technology about exactly this, about why this disinformation, misinformation, pandemics or epidemics with emerging infectious diseases are particularly points of vulnerability because it's a novel pathogen we're trying to learn about and it's a crisis, so everything is moving fast. And, and that is what creates that space well, potentially for confusion and a space for malice for, for actors who are behaving in bad faith as well. Can I have a time check before we take the next question? OK. Uh, more questions in person. Thank you. Um, I, so first of all, thank you for a series of fantastic talks. Um, I'm curious, I want to go back to the point um, that you raised earlier, Rajiv, about the, the issue of the pandemic being bad, but not as bad as it could have been. And the idea that the pandemic that we ended up with was almost, was as bad as it was, was not bad enough. That it, was, it was at a level such that there are people who don't trust public health who could look at what was happening and say, it, you know, it, it, it wasn't that bad and we exaggerated things. And I just wanted to get the panel's thoughts on whether you think we are in some ways in a worse position thinking about the next epidemic because of the, the, the circumstances we were, we were dealt in this pandemic being something that you know, a segment of the population could effectively close their eyes to um, at least you know, the, the feelings that they needed to to engage in you know, the collective action and policymakers felt that they could therefore not engage in, in the kinds of actions that we needed. So I'm just curious the panel's thoughts. Well, I think the, uh, the, the, the bar is not to convince every member of the public that the next pandemic could be worse. It's to ensure that leaders and policymakers understand that and make the necessary investments to be prepared for the, the case that is worse than what we face today. The role of leaders is to, and the reason they're put into power, is to prepare for the low probability, high consequence event, whether it be a hurricane or a pandemic. And uh, it would be a huge mistake, and I think it's happening as we speak in the United States Congress, to say that uh, we don't need to worry much about this, uh, that we're kind of through this one, and we're actually not going to make uh, some people feel we don't need to make much investment to prepare for the next one. So they have that mindset. That's what really concerns me. It's not if I go to a coffee shop and talk to somebody and, and you know, whether they are, are worrying that the next pandemic could be worse. That's okay. Uh, you know, the average person should not have to worry about that. But they depend on their, their leaders that they put in office to do that. Just to add to that, um, 
I, I actually do think, I, I totally agree that SARS-CoV-2 is in many ways not as bad as it could have been, but it's also quite challenging for a number of reasons uh, relating to the fact that it wasn't as bad as it could have been. It's harder to communicate about a disease that doesn't have a 100% fatality rate. It's harder to say, hey, it's really important that you get vaccinated and wear a mask and maybe stay home, even though you might have an asymptomatic infection that you never notice. Um, those kinds of things are really, really hard to communicate. And then, you know, when we look at other pandemics that we've dealt with, uh, H1N1 is a great example. We were very concerned. We attacked it with everything we had. And then people were like, oh, I thought, I thought this was gonna be a lot worse. Why were you all panicking so much? You know, I, I think for epidemiologists, the question is frequently like, what is it that we're not seeing? Um, so I, I think that the next one could very well be worse, more transmissible, more virulent, uh, and that would change some things and make it different and uh, make it difficult in a different way, if that makes sense. I think we had one more in-person question, and if not, we'll we'll take some from Zoom as well. Hello, everyone. Um, I just had a question about the distrust that you uh, had this conversation. Um, I know Dr. Rajiv like, spoke about like this inequality between developed countries and developing countries regarding vaccine distribution and manufacturing. And it just reminded me, um, Doc, um, Bill Gates was asked um, if he wanted to share the COVID-19 vaccine formula with the Serum Institute of India, and he said he wouldn't. So I wanted to know how we would go about in you know, combating this distrust and this colonialism and trying to prevent this pandemic again. Because there just seems to be like, yes, we will be distributing it, but there is this distrust um, in sharing. And like, if the Serum Institute had this formula, I'm pretty sure, because it's the largest institute, we could have prevented many deaths in Africa or in whatever country. And so the fact that they had to put a hold on that and say that we don't want to distribute it to right now to developed countries, we want to focus on India, is kind of groundbreaking that we still have that discussion of colonialism and distrust. So I wanted to get any of the comments from the panelists or even Dr. Rajiv, if you want to start that. So Rajiv, we had this conversation about six months ago or a little bit more than that about this idea of IP sharing. Uh, maybe you want to touch on that a little bit, uh, and which is what I think uh, Shubhi is referring to as well. Well, it's, I don't know what Bill was referring to. And just in the spirit of full disclosure, I used to work for Bill Gates at, at, at the foundation. I, I, I think a part of it may have related to the issue of IP and the, uh, the ecosystem that we have in, around innovation in the world that rewards those who innovate. And because the reward system is what it is, with no judgment on my part, uh, you you bring capital into the space. And the reason that a company like Moderna was able to exist for so long is because the investors had a, the potential of making significant returns if that platform proved to be successful. So uh, we probably would not have had mRNA vaccines when we did were it not for that innovation ecosystem, which does depend upon intellectual property protections. I do think that it's critically important that we do the tech transfers, that we allow self-sufficiency uh, in India, but more importantly in the African region uh, on, for mRNA. Uh, but that is not an issue of snapping your finger and making it happen. And this is where I think there were views that if this had happened last year, then there'd be vaccines today produced by local manufacturers. And I'm certain that that would not be the case. And, it be, and, and actually what's more dangerous is that uh, were that to be the case, chances are the quality would not have been at the same standard as the, the, the rest of the world. Not because there is not the capability of getting to those quality standards, it just takes experience. And, you know, and, and that takes time to develop, whether you're in the US or somewhere else in the world. It's just a kind of a law of physics. You need some time doing things before you can do it reliably and reproducibly well. Uh, and, and, and coming back to the IP question, Nahid, which you're, you, you, your provocative IP question, I, I, you know, I, I actually, I think it's important to realize that these complexities, in my view, are what got in the way of rapid scale up of vaccine manufacturing. It was not the IP, because even if you had removed any and all IP protection, you still have the extremely hard, complex work of getting the experience, putting the quality systems in place, doing the, getting the assays online. It just takes a very long time to do that, and IP, would not, uh, IP rule relaxation would not have, would not have changed that. Completely agree, by the way, this colonial, what, what has been 
called a colonial mindset must go away. I'm pleased to say that there is a lot of uh, momentum around this concept of developing regional manufacturing and distribution capability in the African region and elsewhere. We also have to be realistic that if, the, uh, if it is mRNA, uh, you know, what's going to happen with that facility in peacetime to keep it warm, if you will, and keep the expertise in place because there are no mRNA vaccines that are used in routine immunization programs. So it won't be enough to have mRNA. You'll need to complement that with other vaccines that governments can use for pediatric immunization, adult immunization on an ongoing basis to keep a warm base. Any other thoughts on that before we take a question from Zoom? Um, just, just to add very briefly, I, I think this is another very good example of something that we really wished we had. There were a lot of uh, articles, well-meaning commentaries about brain drain, about public health colonialism, about parachute research for a long time, uh, but the structures that exist still kind of enforce those things to happen. And now that we find ourselves in this particular predicament, we think, oh, actually, it would be really nice if we had a lot of experience and a lot of trained pe people in these areas, and we had the support available. And, uh, and I really hope that uh, one of the things that we get right is that we will not cease to invest in that now that we think that COVID-19 is going away. And I just, I want to second that when it comes to basic research as well. Um, so there has been a real problem, especially with virus discovery work with so-called uh, parachute virology, where people are going into another country, working with the in-country scientists as long as they need to to get their samples, and then taking those samples, going back to the US or Europe, and publishing science nature cell papers without including their collaborators in country. We need to not only be including those collaborators, but we actually need to be building out infrastructure in the countries that we're doing this type of work in so that our, our partners there can be true collaborators so that they can lead their own research programs. And so they'll also have the infrastructure to actually do that research. And that means installing sequencers, training people how to use them, providing them with the computational power they need to do the analysis, making sure that, that all of the research is supported and not just the part where we go collect samples and then take it back to wherever. And so critical because, Reg, you've mentioned the 100-day mission was the G7 countries put together, which, by the way, for those who don't know, um, we can sort of expand on in a second. But the idea that we want to shrink this timeline, it can't be done if we don't democratize the science, if we don't increase the capacity. Are we at time? Should we, do we have time for one Zoom question? One or question. Yes. One last question. One last question. We'll take it from Zoom. Okay, great. Uh, this question asks, can challenges with COVID-19 vaccine acceptance negatively impact vaccination uptake for, those, for other diseases going forward? That's part one. And then part two, US policymakers just dropped assistance for global vaccine efforts in, new, in a new bill. How do we tackle continued vaccine access inequity at all levels? So maybe Natalie, if you want to take that first question, and potentially Maria as you as well. Yeah, well, that's a major concern, the impact of just how, uh, how people have reacted to the COVID, COVID vaccine for kids and all the debate around that and just sort of um, amplifying some existing trends already surrounded vaccine hesitancy and what the impact of that will be on other childhood you know, vaccinations. We've already seen that with um, some changes in policy and it's a that's a major issue. I don't have much in the way of um, of solutions, but it's been a major concern for people who work in the the pediatric vaccine space. And and part of it has been you know, why we've had such high standards for vaccines, particularly vaccines among kids, and that has contrib you know contributed right to some some delays. Uh, is still not having a vaccine kids under five, and I mean I think part of that is making sure that you really. Um, uh, meet the standards that have been been set out because the last thing we want to do is further accelerate that by having a product that, that doesn't sort of work well enough to, to merit its use. Okay. Anything to add? I think you said it very well. Um, the the extra like one two punch that I'm worried about is people delaying childhood immunizations. Uh, not necessarily that they are worried about the safety or the effectiveness, but it just does not seem like a good time to get their child immunized against measles. Um, and we saw um, in DRC that after Ebola, measles is actually um, maybe even a bigger problem. Um, and it's kind of this opportunistic effect, uh, infection for like 
you know, weakened public health medical infrastructure. So yeah, I, I think the answer to your first question is yes. <laughs> the answer to your second question is, it's another thing that would be really nice to have on a longer time frame uh, with continued investment and support for structural interventions like that. Anything on the second question before we call it? Uh, the idea of taking support for global vaccinations out of the bill and the next congressional spending on COVID. Well, I, I would just say that COVAX, which is a global facility to, uh, with the goal of making vaccines more equitably available, was, was launched in, in 2020. And it has had uh, some success, but not, uh, not the kind of success that, uh, that it, it, it was originally designed to have. And I, I, I think that um, there's a big set of learnings around what we need in terms of the, the structures, but also the political instruments to make sure that uh, this kind of inequity, inequity that we saw in this pandemic uh, doesn't repeat itself, but that we build a better COVAX for the next time around. Great. I uh, want to thank all of you for an engaging Q&A, uh, and I want to thank the speakers for really for their thoughts across so many different domains. Can you give them another hand? Thanks very quickly. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to Nahid for uh, chairing just logistically. Um, for everybody on Zoom, we will resume in uh, 25 minutes or so at uh, 1230. There is a different Zoom link for the second panel. It will be emailed out to everybody, but it's unavailable on our website. And for everybody in the room, we have food to mingle and uh, converse. Thank you, everybody, again.